Hi there, it's Celia. I'm going to keep on with my Lyme story. In this video, I'm going to talk about how I got tested. All right, so in the last video, I was talking about how I had a bunch of cachexia wasting towards the end of my grad school time, and I'm going to pick up kind of around there. So in acupuncture school, we had to do these um, off-campus observation shifts. And then our last year, we were, you know, able to give treatments. And so we were an intern. And um, I did my off-campus observation and internships at the clinic of a Lyme literate naturopath and acupuncturist. So this woman was a teacher at our school. She was actually one of the founders of the acupuncture school that I went to. And I knew that she worked with a lot of complex cases and kind of chronic health conditions. And I was always really interested in that because that's what my mentor did when I very first began studying herbalism in the year 2002. She worked with everybody. She worked with cancer. She worked with heart disease, diabetes, and all sorts of other, you know, complaints. But um, so I wanted to kind of get that feel and how Chinese medicine and botanical medicine could be helpful with that. So I observed at her clinic one year. I think I might have done two observation shifts there. And then the next year I was an intern. And so she basically specialize in hard to treat antibiotic resistant Lyme and that's because that's what she had herself many years prior and she couldn't do antibiotics I think because she was very reactive to them like allergic like anaphylactic or skin rash you know she would just break out she couldn't detox antibiotics they did not work for her so she had to find a way to deal with it and then that became her passion. I think at one point she was like blind in an eye or something. Anyways, I found that story compelling. I was drawn to that. Don't you think that's ironic? Um, <laughs> about somebody overcoming their own health issues when the medical community couldn't be there for them. So I found myself there. And while I was there, I never thought that, oh, I have Lyme. And part of the reason is so many of the people that she saw were pretty severe. Some of them had cancer, some of them had autoimmune disorders, some of them had severe digestive problems, mood problems, memory and cognitive problems. They were, you know, tough, tough, tough health situations for these people. And so I didn't see myself in there. Okay. But after I got done with that observation that my last internship there I have a, had a little journal notebook where I kept all the patient notes case notes I guess they're called <laughs> it's been so long I forgot I kept the case notes in this journal and I went back and I read them and it wasn't so much the symptoms that clued or that piqued my interest it was the fact that people had Lyme years ago or even recently, and they had doxycycline, but it didn't work and it became chronic. They had Lyme as a kid, got treated, the treatment wasn't sufficient, now they have chronic Lyme. That story entered my mind, and I was like, hey, that's like me. I had a bullseye when I was eight, and I had some sort of treatment, and it was so unremarkable, I don't even remember it, but it probably was five days of doxycycline. Up until this point, I had forgotten that I had a bullseye from Lyme when I was eight and I was treated from it. I didn't bring that up when I would see doctors, when I was tested for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. I didn't bring that up. I, I don't think I did. I really don't remember connecting that. You know, it's like that, that, that old thread had no meaning for me. But now I was starting to see, oh my God, I get it. Interestingly, also during this time, um, I remembered that I chronically dislocated my right shoulder. It's technically called sublax when you're little. It pulls out of the joint 
Um, it's not a real dislocation, but it's kind of the same mechanism. I did that a lot when I was a kid and I had forgotten until I took like a class about structural diagnosis and they mentioned, the instructor mentioned, who interestingly was um, the ND that I worked with at this clinic that specialized in Lyme. Her husband was a chiropractor and taught this structural diagnosis class at my school. And he said this, and he said, with young children, you often don't realize that they have chronic shoulder dislocation until you go to hold their hand. And they pull back. They don't hold your hand. They squirm away. And it's because it's hard for them to take that form. They can't move their shoulder up. And if they do, they feel in pain. And that brought back this flood of memories of like, I remember this whole time I thought that my mom was hurting me when she held my hand in the parking lot at the grocery store. And I'm like, why are you hurting me? And she was like, why are you squirming away? You're going to get hit by a car. And it all came down to the fact that my shoulder was dislocated and I had forgotten. I just bring that up because we don't remember everything perfectly. We're not meant to have this information etched into your head. You know, like this is not a storage device. It's an experiencing device, the brain. <laughs> So anyways, I kind of came full circle on that part of my story. And it was interesting, but I still didn't yet think that it was for me. Okay, so then the last week of school was the time where we would hand in papers or like take a final exam or something. And in Satya's class, the, you know, um, the Lyme literate ND that I worked at her clinic, LAC, which stands for licensed acupuncturist. <laughs> um, and her class, she also taught at the school. Um, she was like, I'll just be there if anybody wants to talk about anything, just hand in your paper and then you can go. So I, we all handed in our papers. And then a friend and I stayed after the handing in the paper time and asked her to tell us about Lyme. Like, you know can you give us your protocol or like how do you get started working with this and we had a wonderful conversation I recorded it on my phone and she wrote her notes out in my notebook about some basics for Lyme and it was really incredible interestingly she said it can be really simple and I had forgotten about that <laughs> which I'll talk about in a second so all of this had my wheels turning, but it really wasn't until after I graduated um, grad school, which was in August, that I was like hit over the head and like, oh my God, I should get tested for Lyme. Maybe I still have Lyme. I can't believe it took me so long to reach that point. I don't know what brought me to that but finally the light bulb went off and I did just that I had a new doctor that was supposedly integrative but as you may know MDs are very limited in what they can do and if they don't do what is standard of care they get in trouble which is sad so they don't have a ton of freedom. But anyways, she was trained in the Rudolf Steiner type of medicine, anthroposcopic. She was a little bit more open and I felt like I could trust her a little bit more. So I brought up Lyme and she said, yes, let's test you. And I had the ELISA antibody test and the Western blot. It's pretty much all she was going to offer me. She wasn't going to offer eugenics or anything. Um, and amazingly, they both came back positive. Now, remember that I had a bullseye and was treated when I was eight years old, which was 22 years ago. And it is very random that those tests would come back positive after so long. And so my doctor was like, well, just because the test came back positive, doesn't mean you are infected with Lyme right now. All that shows you is that you have had exposure. 
Now you can be bit by a Lyme tick, be exposed and not get Lyme. Or you could have had it when you were eight, got the doxycycline and it's done, but you still have antibodies. So that's what she told me. And let me tell you, that's wrong, okay? <laughs> it's misinformation, as we all know now. So I knew, though, working with the Lyme literate NDLAC that I did, that those tests are often wrong. It was amazing that it even came back. But I really didn't know what to do about it. And the reason I didn't was because I felt very overwhelmed by everything that I remembered Satya did in her clinic. That was the practitioner's name. Her name is Dr. Ambrose, but... Okay, so she would do a lot of genetic testing, a lot of nutrient testing, and those tests would sometimes be like $2,000 or something, and all the supplements people would get, and the medicines, and the cost of appointment. I was like, this is at least going to be $10,000 just to get my foot in the door, and I don't have that money. I don't have it. I just graduated grad school. I can't work until I get my license for acupuncture, which is going to be another few months. And even then, am I really going to make $10,000 quickly? It's like slowly building a practice person by person. And yeah, I could have gotten another job or something. But I didn't. And I was overwhelmed by the cost, mostly. And so I didn't do anything. I just sat on that information. Okay. Now I'm going to finish out this part of the story about um, just this time period, I guess. Uh, what happened after this? So after this, I ran, after I graduated college or grad school in August, the month of September and October, I 100% completely ran on cortisol and adrenaline because that's what kept me going through the last year of, of grad school. It was just in me. I was like, give me the caffeine, let's go. And I did not have high energy. My energy was probably a two out of 10. But I was like, I gotta do stuff. I didn't want to stop because I was afraid I would never get up. Now, this was actually kind of okay. I don't know if okay is the right word. But um, my husband and I went to Italy for three weeks we went there with family. It was super fun and wonderful. So I'm glad I wasn't totally crashed there like I was during my last Europe trip. And they had good coffee there, so I could keep <laughs> partaking in that. Um, but then after I got home, the beginning of November, I absolutely positively descended into a huge, deep, dark hole of bone-crushing fatigue. And I stayed there for five months. And this was one of the most frightening experiences that I have had. I have had huge fatigue flares. I'm trying to normalize saying that fatigue is a flare because it is. It's just not an inflammatory like pain. I mean, it can be. It's a lot of pain. But anyways, you know, I had a bout of fatigue. I've had them before and they always feel bad. But this one was really really intense and I could not fill the hole of having no energy I was a one out of ten can't get out of bed a few days a week I would have to do something like go to the grocery store go to an appointment or try to do something around my house I still had a business that an online business I was trying to do luckily I liked doing that it was like a hobby and so it gave me some joy um Uh, so that was good to have a hobby, but other than that, I couldn't really do much at all. And I was pretty sure that I, this was my life now. I had chronic fatigue and I was never going to be able to get out of that wreck. I just kind of surrendered to that. Okay, so I had this period of intense, intense fatigue, and I pretty much surrendered to the fact that this was going to be the rest of my life. That's just what I thought. It was, it was just overwhelming and really, really hard. 
but I just kept sleeping. I did get a lot of sleep, which was a wonderful thing. So I would wake up in the morning at like nine, got to sleep until nine. I would have breakfast and I would go back to sleep until lunch. I would wake up and have lunch and then I would go back to bed. And then I would get up in the afternoon and evening and then go back to bed probably around 10 or 11. And I did that for five months straight, which was amazing. Like I don't have the ability to do that anymore, but holy moly, I wish I did. Because after five months, I started to get more energy. And in fact, my energy went to a brand new level. It was mirroring just what happened years ago when I went to that herbal retreat center where I just rested deeply essentially and then I came home and I had more energy. So that was a really therapeutic thing in the end but I had no idea there was an end in sight. Now during this time I um, realized how incredibly anemic I was. I'd always been anemic but now my anemia was very very severe and I had uh, very little ferritin stores. I think my ferritin was a level of eight and all of my blood was like, my blood like was small. My blood cells were small and they were not carrying enough oxygen. And I started to address leaky gut during this time. Um, I got off of a leave, which is its whole huge story. Um, I think that really helped repair my gut so I could absorb things better. Um, I actually had another round of parasite testing because, uh, and I had a, like a stool sample, like what is up? Like, ah, uh, man, but I just steadily replenished iron. I ate a lot of iron rich foods and worked on my diet even more and took a ton of iron supplements, a variety of them, and different herbal teas for iron. And yeah, after six months, my iron levels did improve. My ferritin probably, I think it was almost 20, which is huge for me. And my, um, like, I was no longer anemic. I was in the regular zone. <laughs> and I, I felt great. So that was just... Another part of the story that is very, very common for me, being totally worn out, trying to be a normal person, and then crashing like hell. And if I can get the rest, I do recover. So I just want to add that in there. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to start talking about um, what the time leading up to my very big Lyme flare in 2018. Uh... This in 2014, I got pregnant and had my first kid. Um, so I'll talk about what happened between my first kid and my second and then coming down with Lyme later. Okay, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.